Hello, my name is Lee Presser. This is my show. I speak frequently to very interesting people. Some of these conversations are so exciting, so intellectually stimulating, I thought others might like to listen in. This is the reason we started recording Conversation with Lee Presser. Welcome to Conversation with Lee Presser. My guest today is Congressman John Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus has been a member of the Illinois Congressional Delegation since his election to Congress in 1996. He represents the Illinois 15th Congressional District. Congress, Congressman Shimkus is a member of the House Energy Commerce Committee and is chairman of the Subcommittee on Environment and the Economy. That subcommittee has oversight of key environmental laws and programs. Mr. Shimkus is a 1980 graduate of West Point. He served over five years on active duty in the Army, then entered the Army Reserves. He retired with the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in 2008, concluding 28 years of military service. Congressman Shimkus, welcome to the conversation Thanks, again. Thanks, Lee. Thanks. Good to be You're with actually, you. I think one of the top guys, if not the top Ooh. guy, for having been yeah. here. We're yeah. almost up to 15 years now, That's if you can amazing. believe it. Yeah, I it can is. <laughs> It, it's hard for me to believe. Um, I mean, I, I remember before you were you, when you, before you were even treasurer of Madison okay. County. That's how far back uh, we go. Um, but let's just talk. So, normally, you, you, uh, well, you actually told me before we went on the air that in your district, military matters are becoming more on the mind of uh, of, your, of the people who you represent. Is that? That's, That's right. accurate, very accurate, I think. What's on their mind when well, it comes to the military? I think for the most part, ISIS right now and Islamic radicalism and the, and the spread, the uh, decapitation of Christians based upon faith only. This is a very um, conservative area, socially conservative, Christian focused. I think many people thought that that part of our human existence had gone by the wayside. Uh, but it's there for everybody to see in, uh, in any type of communication form that uh, wants to be broadcast. So it has the public very concerned about that part of the, uh, the world. I, with the president in negotiations with Iran and with another, uh, most people really accept our historical uh, alliance and friendship with the state of Israel. Uh, that has people concerned because when the prime minister you know, comes to Washington and says, you know, a no deal is better than a bad deal. I think people in my district sit up and take notice. Then you go to Eastern Europe and you see the the grabbing of sovereign territory by another state, Russia invade the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, uh, again, people thought the Cold War was over, and the reemergence of nationalism in Russia is have people really uh, frustrated and, and uncertain. And uh, um, You know, in that area that you're referring to right now around Ukraine and the Crimea, area, I actually got out some, some maps and I also did some research and found out, oh my God, the Russians have numerous bases all around that area and have for, well, during the Soviet period and one of the most important naval bases that the Soviet Union ever had was right there in the bottom, bottom left of uh, of uh, the Crimea, right, and uh, right there on the Black Sea, and right. so of course uh, they 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 want to control that, and I guess the Russians are willing to do whatever it takes in order to maintain that Black Sea fleet. Yeah, I, I actually I I think that's part of the debate. I think it's bigger than that. I think that uh, the Russians really fear um, expansion of the European community uh, in the economics and in the freedom, uh, the stabilization on the rule of law, transformation. And this is, uh, I think their military installations is a great excuse for them to say we have a national interest and this is okay because we're just connecting up to where we have military. I, I think it's more devious than that. I think it's to create frozen conflicts throughout Eastern Europe so that it, it stops the movement of uh, a European, European community whole and free. Mm -hmm. Well, I understand that uh, even uh, the Baltic states, um, uh, what is it, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, Very those good, three yes. countries, uh -huh. uh, that they have been, uh, they are now members of NATO, as I understand it. 
which means that an attack on one state is an attack on all states, and yet they're to the point of thinking that, hey, an attack on us might not actually bring a response from the rest of NATO. Is this possible? Yes, yeah, it's a sad state when they fear that uh, a alliance that's that's been very strong and helped stabilize Europe for 50 years, that they fear that it won't be complied with. Uh, uh, Lithuania's gone to conscription. Um, and now, Finland's not part of the Baltic uh, countries, but they have, they have just sent a letter to 900,000 reservists about training and location and the like. So this is a fear across whether you're a NATO member or a non-NATO um, uh, state. Uh, we do have uh, Baltic air policing with an air base in, uh, in the Baltics in Chalet, which is in Lithuania, and that's rotational. We also have some boots on the ground, uh, a battalion of a, a cavalry squadron, uh, one company in each country. Uh, it's not much, but it's, I think it's a trip, trip wire. wire. Right. And that uh, those are very important to the folks in the Baltic countries to see U.S. presence. Now, remember I said U.S. presence. It's not NATO presence. Exactly. Uh, when, when this is a, these are bilateral agreements to have U.S. troops on the ground. It does show uh, some leadership. I, I would uh, make them permanent. I would push our, our U.S. presence as far east as we could. Um, that's well, isn't that what that's, the Russians fear? That's, well, that's what they're going to get if they keep grabbing land. I mean, that's what I did. Uh, my big frustration is with, uh, with Germany, who, who um, plays footsies with the Russians because of economics and oil and gas, when many of us spent years of our lives on the West Standing German the border, border right. to protect them from the Soviet aggression. So now they're not willing to give that same freedom and that security to their Europe, Eastern European neighbors. It, I find it egregious, uh, and I... Is something I talk about, especially to them, when I bump into them in Washington frequently. Well, here's a really serious question: Is is there really a NATO except a name? No, there is. I I think that the NATO alliance is still very powerful. Uh, these threats are going to force these NATO countries to meet their obligations of funding. Uh, a lot of more. It's it's a not a law, but it is implied that 2% of their GDP should go to military, military defense. Uh, that was sliding by almost all countries. Uh, now there is a turnaround in goals by many other states to try to get to 2% of the GDP. And it's interesting, the further east you go, <laughs> the more focus they get on, on meeting their requirements to, to upgrade and have a presence. Um, uh, and really, the U.S. has to be involved in training and, and uh, in helping uh, them uh, you know, get to uh, defensive equipment because, as we see, uh, a poorly trained Ukrainian military with no ability to defend themselves is easy fodder for uh, uh, the Russian military. If Dwight Eisenhower were president today, <clears throat> what would he be thinking that of Putin's, Putin's thinking? Oh, I, I, that's a I great know. question. Yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm, what I, I guess what I'm asking, I'm trying to take it away from, yeah. you know, the current, if I ask you what President, uh, uh -huh. President Obama was thinking, what George yeah. W. Bush would have done now, we're, we're back to political questions. Yeah. What I'm really asking is what do serious people think that the Russians are actually going to do or want to do if they can get away with it? Well, I think there's two sides of the debate. One is uh, let Russia be Russia and we, um, we don't want to cause an escalation to a point where we have a major conflict and we'll jettison these, uh, these Eastern European countries that are not members of NATO and that are destabilized and corrupt. And I think the Russians are doing more than just a military intervention. I mean, they're, they're funding uh, political activism, they're trying to destroy economies, they're trying to make it ungovernable so then you can have, what again, frozen conflicts, uh, which is the worst position for countries to be in because they're in limbo and they just exist. They're not either allied with either side um, and that creates a reestablishment of a buffer that um, I think Putin is trying to portray. The other challenge is that his, uh, his ability to use modern media to spin a tale that they are, uh, that, uh, 
that that they are the ones uh, that the offended that, ones, the offended ones, yeah. and and it's been very very success, successful in the Russian people. If you look at public opinion polls and uh, pointing who's to blame, it's the West, uh, and and Putin is only responding to uh, imperialist positions in Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. Turning now to the uh, China Sea, which to me is even more critical and dangerous place. After World War II, the United States was the honest broker that stood in the Western Pacific, keeping all the parties apart. Initially, it was to keep everybody protected from Japan. Then after that, it was keep people protected from Russia. And then, then it turned into the People's Republic of China. And uh, now, now the United States seems to be moving away as the People's Republic of China is establishing these new military zones. You yep. want to comment uh, on that, Colonel? You are. Uh, the South China Sea is a very dangerous place right now. They're building their own islands out there to uh, explain that to people. What What do you mean by that? Well, they can they can Google it and look at uh, uh, Google Maps and follow the the building of uh, from a little atoll, a little reef, to now a, a full fledged island that has uh, a, a runway. Uh, as we remember mm -hmm. in our military history in the Battle of Midway, why were we so successful? Because we had an unsinkable aircraft carrier. That was the island of Midway. Mm -hmm. uh, so now you have unsinkable uh, aircraft carriers in the South China Sea, uh, you know, poses to, to uh, in a disputed territorial area. So it's not the, the international community that says, no, that's Chinese or that's Indonesia or that's Japan. It is, it is, it is, uh, you know, supposed to be fair and free transport and no one makes full claim to that area. Well, the Chinese are trying to make claims to that and it threatens sea routes, it threatens our, our alliance and our friends, friendship and uh, the ability for them to exert uh, military power in an area that we, uh, uh, that many of those countries want to align, continue with, with the United States and not with, uh, remember, China still is a communist country. Uh, they may have some type of market and they're maybe raising up the uh, living standards of some of their citizens, who are, there's obviously quite a few of them, but they're still uh, not democratic and not free and imprison uh, political opponents um, and uh, people of religious faith who don't follow the, the rules of the communist dictatorship. Right. And they're also really great at cyber warfare too. And they have, uh, as I understand it, an entire an entire division of their of their military, their only job is to learn, just like our NSA, to do cyber warfare. My understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong, that they've spent a lot of time aiming this high-powered technology that they have at places like Boeing and other um, highly secure uh, government contractor con uh, companies and have literally just squeezed all this uh, very, very important technology out of them. Is yeah, that, well, in cyber warfare... Am I, am I ex exaggerating? Or I don't is think this? you're exaggerating. I think they're, they're trying to find any nook and cranny in the system where they can get in, even in our modern media and the motion picture industry, right? Yes. They, uh, they're able to pull out what they can. Don't ask, don't, you know, don't ask me how it's done. I'm just... It's, yeah, I'm clueless talk, with that. You have to talk to a 15 year yeah, old. Yeah, X and O's, yeah. you know. That, that's a, uh, but uh, they, they are, are spend a lot of time, effort, and energy to do that. And we, in essence, have to do the same. Uh, uh, there will always be, not just in the government area, but in corporate America, a, a, a big role for people um, in the cybersecurity uh, realm now because of as soon as you send up, uh, create a, a defensive wall, the opposite. It's just like an arms race, it, but it's in the cyber world, and it's um, it's challenging. My point, though, is that the United States is really good at developing new technology, new weapons technology. The unfortunate part is we're so broke we can't afford to build it. I'm saying that now that they have access to all this technology that we have invented, they do have the money to build it, and they are <clears throat> currently building up their military forces to where they they will soon be our equal, perhaps our superior. Are you familiar with the hypermissile? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay, well, just briefly, I'm not going into anything, but they, ha they are working on a missile which actually travels at 
between eight to ten times the speed of sound. And it is going to be used, perhaps, as a uh, carrier killer mm -hmm. because we have no defenses to get anything that's moving that fast. I'm, I'm con personally, I'm concerned about mm -hmm. that. Uh, I would suggest that perhaps your staff might want to brief you on these things because I've seen this, um, I've seen this the last uh, several, actually the last year, there's been considerable talk about, especially in 2014. Um, let's see, I have a whole <laughs> long list of things here to talk about. Shrinking American military capabilities. Do you agree? Well, yes, uh, especially when we had uh, the, which is still kind of the law of the land, although we've uh, postponed it, the sequestration debate. But in the last National Defense Authorization Bill and the Defense Appropriation Bill, we have matched the president's number to increase military spending. So I think the things that we talked about before, the public understands that we live in a dangerous world, not a safer world. This is not the time to reduce the size and strength of the military. This is the time to stop the bleeding and, and make sure that we have the most equipped, uh, the best trained, uh, most deployable forces in the world, and we're trying to get that way. We um, just recently, uh, last week, we passed our National Defense Authorization Bill, which uh, uh, which we think gets us in, turned the ship in the right direction. That's good. Speaking of ships, I mean, when I was in the uh, the Navy, we were aiming. This is during the Reagan administration. We were aiming at a 600 ship Navy. Now I understand <coughs> the latest numbers show that we have. 272 deployable battle force ships. Yeah. That's you know, yeah, and that's a great debate, and uh, I'm not disputing those numbers because they're accurate, um, but the world's also changed a little bit too. That was before we had the stealth bomber, um, and you know, we, can, we can deploy and, and drop bombs on enemies uh, from Whiteman Air Force Base you know, <laughs> into the Middle East and land and uh, uh, off the the coast of India, refuel, rearm, fly back. Uh, so, and I remember a schematic where uh, a squadron of, you know, stealth bombers equals an aircraft carrier group. And you know, an aircraft carrier group has a lot of ships. Yes. Like, I don't know how many, but, you know, you, not just the aircraft carrier, but all the ships that help support and protect and defend the aircraft carrier group. So, um, Again, technology continues to improve, and we hope that, that we have you know joint forces, and we use all our means to be able to uh, uh, show that we can, which is our constitutional responsibilities, defend uh, our country against all enemies, uh, foreign and domestic. The debate always is, what about other countries and the deployment, and how do we get involved, and do we get involved to a point where, you know, again, going back to ISIS, and the debate now is what? redeploying troops back to Iraq, you know, people, that's the last thing people want to do, but they understand that ISIS is just, they're just bad people. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I truly believe that if the United States doesn't lead, I think you alluded to this, the world can't get led. Well, our part of the world, the other part of the world <laughs> is being led. You know, it's interesting, yesterday was, um, was Memorial Day 2015, and um, they had a whole bunch of, uh, of old, War, you know, war movies. And I, I had the opportunity to see some of these things. They were like, some of them were really four star movies. And it suddenly dawned on me <clears throat> from, from uh, there was one that was a really great movie. I think it's called Battle, Battleground, Battlefield, something like that. It was about the, uh, the fight in Baston during the, uh, the Battle of the Bulge. And they had some chaplain come on and talk about, you know, what is it that we're fighting for here? And uh, he made a really good speech, but suddenly it like dawned on me, you know, people say, oh, well, we don't want to get involved in a regional war. Well, when the Nazis were taking over Europe, that was a regional thing, mm -hmm. which eventually drew the United States into that. What I'm looking at ISIS right now, we just call them a group of terrorists, but they're an army. Mm -hmm. They're a real army and they have real political philosophy and they're really taking territory on the ground and they're trying to set up this enormous, what they call caliphate, we can call it a country or an empire. Why, I, I, I'm just thinking that people really need to wake up and okay. see for what it really is. Right. Sure, after World War I, we didn't want to go back to Europe right. for World War II. Right. 
you know, it took the attack on Pearl Harbor. What's it going to take this time? Right. Well, I do think the public is more inclined, though, as I, we started about earlier, that they, they are focusing on world events much more than I've seen in really my career here as, as a representative. Good. <laughs> People should be aware of what's going yeah. on around them. Um, let's see. Oh, nuclear waste. We've talked about that before. Yeah. Is that still an issue in your life? Oh, it's a big issue. I spent a, uh, a lot of time on it. <laughs> talk about it's it. It's part of my portfolio. Uh, yeah, talk, talk well. about it. Uh, we're, in short, just so that we bring people up yeah. to speed, we are trying to build this big cave somewhere. I don't know. Well, uh, we spent 30 years, $15 billion to, uh, and it's the law of the land that Yucca Mountain should be the National Geological Repository. All scientists believe that the best way to handle nuclear waste is to have it underground in geological isolation uh, forever. Um, and so that's the path we went on. Uh, it is the law of the land. Uh, Yucca Mountain, everybody thinks, well, it's just a mountain. Well, it's not a mountain. It's where the nuclear test site was. So you had ground bursts of atomic bombs. You have uh, uh, an Air Force base just north of there. You, it's 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 miles and miles uh, before you even get in the fence line. I mean, you still got to drive 15 miles just to get to Yucca Mountain. And there's a five mile cave um, tunnel and then a one half mile cross cut. Uh, it's the most studied piece of ground uh, in the history of this planet. Uh, the scientific evaluation report just re came out in December. It said Yucca Mountain will be safe for a million years once closed. So in this area, not too much. We got Callaway in uh, in Missouri that has high level nuclear spent nuclear fuel. And it's uh, just sitting there, right? Just sitting there. Just sitting and there. Clinton up the road uh, just in Illinois, sitting there. just <laughs> sitting there. And uh, you know the argument is it needs to be there. Uh, that spent nuclear fuel. That's an agreement we have with the nuclear industry to then place it somewhere. So we need to follow up on our commitments. Uh, but there's also uh, uh, what, what we call is uh, high nuclear waste from the weapons development, and we deal with it in the St. Louis area. Um, but there are some really uh, troubling areas like Hanford, Washington, right, um, uh, right in the southern part of the state of Washington State, where you have 75 million gallons of toxic sludge that uh, in underground tanks that some think are are leaching into the Columbia River. Uh, that stuff needs to go, and we're spending hundreds of millions and probably billions of dollars to reclaim that, glassify it, and the plan is to store it in Yucca Mountain also. What's the holdup? President Obama mm -hmm. and uh, now Minority Leader Harry Reid, um, who uh, President Obama made a promise to Harry Reid that if Harry Reid would deliver electoral college votes, he would stop the movement on Yucca Mountain. Remember, oh, is that in Nevada in his state? It's in the state of uh, Harry Reid's state, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, amazing, isn't oh, it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. But remember, <clears throat> President Obama is from the state of Illinois. Right. What state has the most spent nuclear fuel in the country? You tell me. The state of Illinois. Right. So, so we need to get this somewhere safe. So it's just a, a battle. We're winning it, but it's not as quick as I would like. We got about five minutes left here. Is there uh, any areas that you would like to talk to the people about and talk, you know, tell them? Well, I, I think the uh, Memorial Day is always uh, an important time. Uh, I was in Danville yesterday uh, celebrating. There's a national cemetery there. That's part of my district. There's a VA hospital. Um, it rained. <laughs> it got real wet. But it's just an important time to remember the sacrifices of those who answered the call to serve. Um, my committee assignments, we've, you've kind of alluded to uh, the nuclear waste. The other thing that we're working on very diligently is uh, reforming our toxic chemical law, which was passed in 1976, hasn't really been touched since that time. And it's moving in a strong bipartisan manner. So uh, the Senate's moved a bill outside of their, uh, outside of their, sub, uh, their, their committee. We moved it through a subcommittee, and now when I get back next week, we should uh, get it through the full committee. And what are you trying to accomplish with well, this bill? Well, you, you understand what's going on in the world today that uh, states are saying chemical A is not safe, so we're going to ban it from our state. Well, the Constitution and the new Constitution we live under uh, is about interstate commerce. 
So can a state prohibit the use of a chemical on their own? Uh, the answer is not really. But unless we have a good system to test that and make our own judgment, then why not? Because they can't trust the EPA to render a sound judgment. So we're trying to get the EPA to render sound judgment in a timely manner. So then we can say to the state, no, it's safe. To the industry, no, you can use it. Or industry, you can't use it. It's not safe. We're going to ban it. That's kind of the premise. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the EPA is supposed to be this independent arbiter in this? Yeah, they sh I mean, just they, they're supposed to be. Yeah, they're supposed to be our experts, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, and uh, an agency that we have a lot of problems with uh, and fight with all the time. But uh, this is their role um, uh, that, that they are supposed to be doing. So we're trying to help them deal with, they do, they do a pretty good job on, it, on new chemicals, but there's a list of 8,000 chemicals in their commerce that they've never touched. So we're trying to get them to ramp up their ability to find the worst chemicals, get them tested. We're also going to give uh, the industry the ability to pay on their own to have their chemicals of their choice reviewed, so that brings more certainty to the market. In the last minute or so, what, what do you make of this army of guys that want to be president of the United States on the Republican <laughs> side? I'm not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I, think it, I think it speaks to that they believe there's an opportunity to a address a message uh, that might have resonance and might get them a chance to be what they're aspiring to be, to be the leader of the free world and president of the United States. So. I don't look at it as bad. I mean, Republicans historically have been, well, who's next in line, right? Well, we're not there yeah, this time. Right. <laughs> so, there, is, there is no line. So let the debate begin, and hopefully that brings more people <clears throat> to the party and interest than fewer. And do you think that there will be, uh, right up to the end, this long list of people, or do you think that there's going to be a, a winnowing out pretty quick? There's a natural winnowing out of any process but I mean when you got so many you can still have seven There's what, people two, left standing 24 <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's like pick me yeah, pick me pick yeah, me yeah. you know um, I, I would very much like instead of <clears throat> pick me I would very much wish that they would say here's a philosophy if you believe in this right. philosophy then vote for me and I will execute that philosophy well that's usually why you choose a political party I mean you would think uh, Republicans have a set basis of principles, less government, individual responsibility, lower taxes, more personal freedoms and liberties. Democrats are liberals, so they believe in government intervention, government taking from those who have to try to redistribute it to those who, who don't. And they think they're being a better arbiter of, of the country in that main. So it's just who's best mm -hmm. to, to send that message. Thank you very much for being with us. We're completely out of time. Certainly appreciate your coming and being with us again. Thank you, Lee. To my audience, I've been speaking with Congressman John Shimkus. He's the uh, congressman that represents the 15th district of Illinois, which is what, how many counties? 33. 33 counties he represents, or parts of them. Anyways, this is going to be uploaded to YouTube. If you saw part of it and you want to see the rest, go there. Thank you. See you next time. Goodbye.